Hello, everybody, and welcome to the um, discussion circle or question and answer session following the fifth and final lecture in a series that I've been giving. Um, and I assume that if you're here, you probably are aware of the series and have seen it, um, seen these videos, but sometimes people just uh, click on the latest video. Uh, this would probably make a lot more sense if you would go back and look at the playlist and, and see the things we're following up on. We're going to have a discussion following the final three chapters of a book that we were looking at together. And because it's the final section, also just any concluding thoughts, final thoughts. So again, presuming that you have been watching this series, you probably see some mostly familiar faces here, people who've been with us uh, before, but we do have a newcomer, somebody who's been uh, actively following this, this whole series and channel since the beginning, but just hasn't been in a discussion circle before. So um, he's also somebody that uh, I've had contact with over the years and uh, in contact with in other ways. So um, Christopher, would you like to present yourself and tell how you came to be involved in all this and what your interests are? Yeah, well, uh, thanks for having me on, first of all. It's uh, nice to see all the familiar faces from the previous uh, discussion circle. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, my name's Christopher, I'm from New Zealand. Uh, my interest in languages, why? Well, well, I majored in German at university. That was, I guess, the first language I learned. And um, I think like David mentioned in the previous discussion circle, he had the unusually positive experience of having a really good teacher in high school that helped him learn uh, uh, Spanish, I think it was. So I was, I was the same. I had a really good teacher who um, taught both German and French. And he got me started on French. So I taught myself uh, French when I got to university. So those two languages have really been the two that I've been slowly, steadily improving over the years. And uh, they also happily happen to be the two that uh, you often recommend, Professor, being the first two languages that are, you know, would be polyglot should learn. Absolutely. Because they grant access to so many um, other resources. Absolutely. Uh, right now, I'm learning Georgian, which is a very interesting language and has the perk for me that most of the resources for it are actually in German. So I have to know German in order to learn it. And uh, it's good that William's on here because I remember he mentioned um, ancient Greek actually in the first lecture. and. Uh, that's been mentioned a few times since uh, I noticed it's come up. Uh, I remember we had a Greek uh, speaker on. So I've, I've sprung for Asa Meal's um, Greek course as well, which I'm going to try and add into my uh, schedule. So I'm really looking forward to learning that. And I think it ties in nicely with the, um, the idea of polyliteracy, which is not just being able to read many languages, but also mm -hmm. being able to access historical uh, and classical languages. I think it'd be a really nice kind of initial foray into uh, into, into that, that world of uh, ancient languages. So yeah, happy to be here. Wonderful. Now, you and I, I think we can say we met uh, in a sense back in the days of the How to Learn a New Language Forum when you wrote uh, a, a letter asking for sort of a five-year plan and ways of developing things. And at that stage, I, I enjoyed that aspect of the forum where I could you know, answer questions in, in a lengthy fashion. Um, and I've pointed that out here as I've come back into this sort of reincarnation of making videos again. I, I really am happy and, and uh, excited that um, you all are engaging in these lengthy conversations in the, in the comments section. Um, but when people ask me questions, I don't want to answer there because I just feel like it, it gets lost and nobody will see it. So I, I would much rather... Uh, again, I don't know why and how people track me down and ask and write me these lengthy protracted letters asking for advice and it, it pulls my heartstrings. I'd love to give it, but it, it takes hours for me to answer that. And, you know, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, that's a big time commitment. And if I don't know the person, I, 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 you know, I want it to be in some format where people are able to see it. So um, that was a great aspect of that forum that uh, we could have the sort of question of the week or something. And I like the way that, you know, when um, people would, uh, maybe I indulge it too much, but it's nice to engage in informal written English. That's not something we often get to do most mm -hmm. often. It's so, you know, if you have something which is like, rather than just a, a text message, hey, how do you do this? But, you know, giving your background, giving your interests and, you know, asking for a full fledged, fleshed out sort of plan and purpose. Um, if I can, um, answer something like that for somebody, I'm happy to do that, particularly if that can be in a format the way that that forum was, you know, where it's sort of a, a public record that people can go back and, and do that. So um, did you, uh, the, the, that five-year plan, how much of that did you ever implement or, you know, sort of 
Is it turning? That was about 15 years ago, wasn't it? I mean, how long? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, plans do change. And obviously, you know, my, my career kind of went down a different path. I actually work as a software developer. So I tend to I deal more with computer languages than, um, than foreign languages, at least by profession. Um, I mean, I did, I did kind of branch off, you know, I think I can't remember exactly what I wrote. I did a bit of Spanish and Swedish. Uh, they're, they're, I guess they're, you know, if I spent a few months with them, I could bring them up to an active level. And they have, you know, they're reasonably familiar with, uh, reasonably uh, similar to, you know, French and German. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've just, you know, I've done, I've dabbled in other languages, but I think French and German are really the only two that I've managed to generate enough momentum with to actually, you know, get some speaking, active mm -hmm. speaking abilities. So I'm hoping to, you know, with Georgian, I can do something with a completely <laughs> different language. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting. But, you know, this, this polyitis thing is, you know, it is a real affliction, you know, and it's, it's easy to be dragged in different directions all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, just, you know, again, like, you know, William mentioning ancient Greek, I just thought, you know, slowly reeled me in to uh, wanting to yeah. learn the language. And you know, lo and behold, you know, just ended up ordering some stuff for it. There you go. Mm -hmm. Since you mentioned William again, again, let's, let's not presume that everybody who's watching this uh, has, has seen us before. I mean, we don't need to do a full-fledged introduction, but just uh, again, so briefly, everybody else say who you are, where you are, and, and, and why you are. So, William? Um, my name is William, but you can all call me Will in the comments if you want. So, um, in, in the comments, you don't show up in the comments as well. You show up as Fisco Gamer or something. Right. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> but I think most of the people already know me. I, okay. I comment most of the videos. I comment most of the videos already. I think okay. most people already know. Right. Uh, but I've I've learned English through Google Translate. Everyone says that Google Translate is bad, but I've learned through Google Translate, and I and it works. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, my native language is Portuguese. And I'm now learning ancient Greek, Latin, and Japanese. Okay, good. And then we have we have two Chinese people here. They don't look it, but they're both in Beijing. <laughs> Why aren't you guys together? I told you, like, go to a cafe together. And it's, you know, it's, it's, what is it, six in the morning there? You could go out and get out, you know. Have yeah, you, I just trying. Met each other? I, I, I messaged you back on the comments. Matthew left you a did? comment. Uh, yeah. yeah, I messaged you back. I was like, yeah, send me your WeChat. Whenever you get a second, yeah. you can send me. Uh, but in the, just in the comments okay. below. Yeah. In the comments below, if you get a second, yeah, just send yeah. me your WeChat. You can tell me later. I was, th I was thinking, how video. didn't he see my comments? And uh, okay. I, think the, I think the comments <laughs> disappear. Like, I might notice the same thing. The comments just vanish. On comments YouTube. do disappear. I mean, that's, let me say this openly to everybody who's, who's watching this and hearing this. I mean, I, you know, again, I don't, I don't, you know, jump in immediately to the, the video. At a certain point, I go through, and if there's anything substantive, I, I at least say thank you, and I'll, I'll answer somewhere else. But there's something weird about things. I mean, I can sometimes see there's a little bell up at the top right hand corner, and it'll tell me that I don't know that, that Christopher said, posted a comment, and then I'll go into. The, and there's no way I can see the comment or I can answer it, and then people are saying things disappear. So, um, yeah, there's some uh, there's some instability there. Um, but at any rate, I, I wouldn't want to say disappointed is too, too much too far, but I did kind of think that, you know, Matthew and Chase, you would be together and we could like, because this virtual <laughs> meeting is kind of neat, but I just thought, wow, that'd be really neat if, you know, through this meeting of mine. I would like that. Meet people together have, in, in Beijing. Yeah. Since I caught the language bug, I haven't been able to just sit down with somebody and kind of just geek out <laughs> over, a good, you know, a cup of coffee and talk languages. <laughs> so that would be a treat, I have to say. <laughs> All right. So both of you, do you want to give a little background? You're both in Beijing as uh, as teachers of various things. So let's hear about that, and and also the languages you guys are working in and your general interests. Hmm. Chase. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm Chase. Uh, currently, I'm teaching film, uh, film history, and writing. AP English, but I call it writing. Uh, language they love they love these long titles for courses but film and media what is what's the media part of this course it's a course about film but uh, i'm teaching film writing and history in english at a high school in china i originally in high school wasted two years of my life studying spanish uh without motivation being as um under what is under the 
what was the type of motivation? I believe you called it, Professor uh, Compulse, being forced. Compulsory, uh, yeah, extrinsic yeah. motivation. Yeah, somebody thanks else you. Extrinsic. Yeah, compulsory, and uh, just did not get anywhere with that. In college, I took one year of mandatory Italian. Um, again, didn't really get anywhere with that. And then later on in college, the last two years, I just, after I had grown interested in literature and poetry on my own initiative, just by myself, uh, kind of having an awakening, you might call it, I really had a strong desire to try to learn some other languages by myself to read literature in the original, I really, uh, especially poetry. And I started with Spanish again, because I, at that time I was thinking I would go back and, you know, do what I didn't get to do right the first time. And I self-studied by myself in my last two years of college. I self-studied Spanish by myself in my last two years of college. And looking back now, I kind of see that as like my trial run. I made a lot of, uh, I just made a lot of, what I would call fundamental mistakes about not having consistency, um, not just switching from method to method, trying to, uh, to uh, trying to many different resources, those kinds of fundamental mistakes. And then after I graduated college, I got a job offer in China. And so I, um, I said, okay, I'm going to China. And I, <laughs> and I left Spanish on the back burner and I threw myself headlong into Mandarin. And then four years of my life passed by with work and Mandarin and that being pretty much uh, my life. And so um, now after about four years, my Mandarin's at a comfortable level. And I am, I have just started learning Russian in the last year. And so I'm getting a good footing in Russian and then yeah, hopefully I'd like to dive into some ancient languages in the future like we talked about last time. Matthew, you're also immersed in Mandarin. Right. Yeah, I've been here for about eight years. Um, I guess uh, briefly in high school, I did uh, I had Spanish and French classes, and then um, uh, I was really interested in learning Russian because of this video game, <laughs> and um, and I was trying to teach myself Russian and really didn't know what I was doing. Found that I think that forum was started it was already going then, or that website was going. I tried to follow. Uh, how to learn from there basically <clears throat> started using a lot of flashcards and reading a lot but then i don't know later on in uh, university I, I took several years break after high school before university and uh like you know was doing like a kind of landscaping job where you could listen to audio all the time and i was trying to uh, learn several languages like that but not just spinning my wheels and then uh, in university, um, I got all of my core credits out of the way and I um, uh, got into a higher level of Spanish and French by taking a, a test. And I made German my major and uh, studied, I uh, got into like the second year of Russian based on how well I'd studied on my own, uh, jumped a year ahead in Mandarin. Uh, but then even after you study, if you, if you finish 202 and, you, and you're in university, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean you can really use it really. Um, Cause I remember finishing my German major and everyone's saying, oh, the Harry Potter method, read Harry Potter. And uh, I couldn't read Harry Potter. <laughs> um, uh, I came to China uh, because I wanted to, I guess, master uh, Mandarin and I, I ended up staying here long term. I have a wife. We have a child on the way, um, mm -hmm. and uh, I've taken several. I've just kind of let go a few times yeah. and just said I'm going to study uh, twenty languages. And I've done that before. I've maintained that for about three months at a time. Um, but I think I had I didn't have a tolerance for not knowing things, and I thought that it wasn't working, so I gave up on that several times. Um, and also there's resistance everywhere. Uh, you can't talk to people about it. It's weird, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, if you can't mm -hmm. speak, if you can't speak them like uh, really, really, really well, then you'll get criticized yeah. for yeah. why are you doing this? Maybe you can't even do one really well. Um, it comes in the form mm -hmm. of like uh, 
like uh, the wife, for example, like it, it comes yeah. everywhere about why you're doing that. Mm -hmm. So the only time to do it is in the morning. You get up really early. And, uh, <laughs> and now we're, yeah. we're taking your study time. Sorry about that. Uh, I, I do seriously feel bad about that. I don't want this. You, I think you mentioned you want this to turn into a five hour marathon. These are getting longer and longer. I don't want to have that happen <laughs> that we go for five hours and and you know, intrude on things. It's nice to keep a certain amount of discipline. So with that said, let's go back to the book that we just finished off and see mm -hmm. uh, if we have any uh, questions. Chase, as last time you were kind enough to make a uh, sort of a list of some of the questions, but I, I don't know, I mean, that this, this last video has exploded into this incredible long uh, interchange. I don't know yes. how to pull questions out of there that are, are, are like haven't been answered. And on that note, I, I do have a question for those of you who might know computers or internet or YouTube or something a little bit better. Uh, on the one hand, I, I'm really, really, really happy to see that like active exchange and stuff like that. But it makes me wonder how many people are actually watching the video because is it the same people going back in time and time and time again and answering things? You know, so when I see it, it's been seen by 800 or 1500 people. Has it really been seen by 1500 different people, or is this like? And half that number, the same people go back. Does it remember when you go in? And so like you've been in there once and then you go in and again, it doesn't count as another view. I don't know how that works. Um, Increments the view. Huh? I think it increments the view. So, you know, if you go in and just load the video multiple times, it'll show up um, an additional view. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if 800 uh, people can watch it all the way through, yeah. but. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. So it's kind of interesting yeah. to me to see how many people are like going back and having this live active interchange. So. I don't know if there's anything to um, to pull out of that that we haven't answered, but since Christopher, you're new here and you haven't been on before, and I don't think you've been participating in that written exchange, would you like uh, to kick us off with uh, with any kind of questions or thoughts that you had about this this last video, these last three yeah. chapters? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, I have been trying to contribute, but I've got that problem where like my comments get swallowed by uh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. I don't realize until I've logged out that they're actually uh, not visible. Mm -hmm. But um, so there's a, there's a bunch of comments from, um, I guess that's Mac the American, Mac on Metaconic. Yep. Who, uh, so he, he's written a bunch of stuff. Um, he wrote one comment actually just kind of mirthfully. He said, uh, he was quoting your video. He said, uh, to do that, you'd have to watch television. And who wants to watch television? So I guess I can <laughs> kind of sympathize with that. I'm proud to say I never owned television. Um, so he made one comment about culture. Um, so he said, um, I'll just kind of read it quickly. He said, I can only laugh at Hall's opinion that discussion of culture beyond the actual language is useless. As you, Professor, told us in the first lecture of the series, you may come into learning a language with a single goal for an exam or a job, but one would hope that more goals, such as an interest in the culture, would soon be added. And only when you've added two, three, four uh, goals does, does the learning really accelerate and blossom. And then he goes on to say, uh, you may have no problem finding motivation to learn languages, but most learners, perhaps as many as up to 90%, don't end up learning a language. They stop, give up, lose interest. And so his, he says, uh, you know, he thinks any responsible textbook should bear that in mind. And to him, that means the culture should indeed be included. And then he finishes off, he says, for, whom those, for those whom culture doesn't interest, it's quite simple to skip those sections. Uh, I don't see how it does any harm, but I can see how its absence could. So I guess I, kind of may I have well, I also read this comment and I just wanted to say, cause this, like, it felt like there was a simple answer to this that was kind of strange to me that he didn't consider like, uh, following on professor, professor, your comment, I think you were talking about the Oxford and Cambridge series, uh, Latin mm -hmm. series, I forget what they're called. Yeah. Yes, about them. Um, I haven't actually seen them, but of course, tons of textbooks do this. Now you open any beginner textbook and yeah, they'll have um, cultural snippets, cultural bites all mm -hmm. throughout, like one per chapter or something explaining. And I, I, well, while, while the idea of including like uh, information about the culture in the textbook is fine per se, I'm not against that. Like the simple solution, why not? Okay, for the first five or 10 units, while you're still an absolute beginner, you know, you're learning uh, if they're assuming again, that the learner is starting from absolute zero. Okay, first five or 10 uh, lessons, we won't include any, we'll keep it, you know, we'll keep it very basic. But then why not write the cultural units 
in simple target language? Why not write these in simple Latin? Again, of course, you're gonna, you're not, you're gonna, they're obviously, they will be simple. You can't, um, you can't have any bells, uh, bells, how do you pronounce it in French? Bells atrocious? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. bells atrocious. Thank you. Uh, you know, you can't be very grandiose about it, but of course, I, 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 that just seems like such a simple fix to me. Why not just write these in simple Latin? That, that I'd never understood why not do that. Why waste my time when I want to learn Latin? Uh, I do want to know about Rome. Tell me about Rome in Latin. I, I never, I, I just, I don't get that. Well, in the, the particular examples that I gave, I mean, they do have those, you know, the, the, there's plenty of information in Latin about stuff, but then there's so much more supplementary material. And it is interesting. It's not, it's not you know, it's not bad material, but I think the point is, um, that when you're, you know, when you're learning a language, you need to be concentrated and focused on learning the language as such. And this kind of thing, it can, with the best of intention, it can be too distracting. It can sort of take your mind off the immediate task at hand. And I, the, what one way I think of it is, I mean, ideally, when you're in language learning mode, you should be putting your brain into that language as much as possible. And then like in the same thing where you're getting that feed, to put your language and your brain into that mode, then that same source is taking your, your brain back and putting you back into the language that you're so much more comfortable thinking on at a higher level, Exactly. you know? So it's then, then to switch your brain back. Okay, now here's a formula, a few more sentences in Latin. Now here's a really long, interesting paragraph about all about the whole <laughs> the man and the slaves and this here. And, you know, mm. you got five pages of this, you know, interesting, dense, you know, Oxford Don written information about ancient culture, then you're going to just be like, wow, thinking about that. And then almost going back to, okay, now this ablative absolute construction is sort of, that makes that seem like the, the distraction. So um, right. I don't know if that's something you need to be so dogmatic about, but it was yeah, just some interesting comments. Um, he In this section, as I pointed out in my lecture, Hall made some kind of weird comments that it seemed to me that if, you know, if he weren't, um, a professor of Romance languages, if you weren't you know, who'd written a French textbook, you would say, why are you saying this? I don't think you know what you're talking about. But he clearly knows what he's talking about, but he just had a different life experience. I, I don't know how to explain that. Every so often something like that happens. Um, you know, you, you meet somebody and, 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 and you say, you, you know, I, every time I go to take the bus, it's always late. And he says, what do you mean? I take the bus every day and it's never late. And it's like, well, I, <laughs> what do you do? You know, we're living the same life and you're having a difference. It's sort of like that, you know, to, to make yeah. such a huge fuss about French somehow being supposedly <laughs> qualitatively oh. more different, oh. more difficult this? than Spanish and Italian. French being on yeah. French being, you know, something uh, that you need. That, I just, I just can't fathom why. Oh, he, no. I, yes, William. I yeah. Okay. I read Hall, and well, I was kind of weirded out by it as well. I, I've, I've learned a little bit of Spanish and French. I never say I speak or understand those languages because it's, it's too little. I did too little of them. But I speak Portuguese, so most of it is comprehensible anyway, so I never even focus on it. But I think I know what he was talking about. I think he was talking connecting. I even commented about this: connecting the writing form with this the the spoken form. Not necessarily to understand anything, but to so, oh, I see this word, I can read it out loud. In uh, language, for example, um, Hungarian, Finnish. I think this comes rather quick, but in French, is always we like. Do I know to speak how to pronounce this word? Do I know how to do it? it it's always confusing. I learned a little bit of French and th this confusion always got me. Even though I've le I'm learning Japanese that the confusion gets even worse. In many <laughs> levels. In many levels. Yeah. Um, Matthew, what do you I think? think yeah, do you remember uh, one of your videos was learning, uh, was about learning German, French, Spanish, and Italian? Mm -hmm. You recommended an, an order for those. And it was either Spanish or French first. Um, and then uh, 
but the rash i think the rationale was that uh i guess it was spanish italian french then german i guess i'm not i'm not certain the third the third one i think was was german and it was the idea of using two hours mm -hmm. uh, so use two hours probably with uh uh either spanish or french but i think you you said that if you're going to compare the two then french is probably a little bit more difficult um but uh i i think i think maybe he came from a background of uh italian first and everything's really phonetic mm -hmm. and most of the romance languages are phonetic and then he didn't have good access to really good recordings just how many like actual recordings did uh, records did he have in his time so maybe he was relying on mainly texts and mm -hmm. maybe he didn't have a drill master <laughs> mm. <laughs> so maybe maybe this was a, a headache he had in his day mm -hmm. yeah but he refers to other you know other methods some earlier method around the turn of the last century that was you know all around um writing french like in ipa rather than in <laughs> so, I, I don't know. I suppose, I mean, he, he made an interesting point earlier, and we're all, except for William, Native English speakers. And so he pointed out, as Native English speakers, we, from the word go, we're not trained to associate words with shape and meaning. We don't listen for it. We don't think right. since we're used to it. And so when we come to French, it's, it's like, okay, well, it's the, same, it's the same chaos that we're used to. Whereas if you're not used, if you're used to a system in order, I think, William, what you said is, is true. I think that, you know, we could just take, take somebody, you know, here and say, we're going to, or do like the, the army does. We're going to, okay, we're going to drill you for 30 hours and we give you 30 hours of French and 30 hours of Spanish. After 30 hours of Spanish, then we're going to put a text in front of you and you have to read it aloud. And you might not understand mm -hmm. what you're saying, but you'll have internalized the sound system enough that some Spanish listener with a forgiving ear, he'll be able to follow most of what you're saying. Whereas if we give you a French text after 30 hours of French and we put a French person listening, he'll have a really, really hard time following. But it's that, that's not necessarily, I don't think anybody's goal in, in learning the, the language. No, uh, interesting uh, points there. The, 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 what I was like, what Paul would have specified, if he would have specified his claim a little bit to say, yeah, like, if, if we're just comparing, will you be able to read aloud with accurate pronunciation Finnish mm -hmm. versus French after 30 hours? I would support that claim from all I know of Finnish and French. Mm -hmm. I would say that's reasonable. But if you're just talking about overall difficulty, being able to jump into literature, mm -hmm. uh, that, that I, 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 did, yeah, yeah. I don't know how he got there. That's, that's, I that's mean, crazy. He was or talking about jump starting the reading, right? No, not say, oh, right. go read Dostoevsky or something of mm -hmm. the sort. Say, oh, uh, start uh, reading. Mm -hmm. That's what he was right. saying. I think, yeah. okay. I think that there's a fundamental difference between, um, <clears throat> as I've called before, you know, normal people and people with polyitis. I think that normal people tend to, if they don't understand, an aspect of a language they, they can just like completely shut down and then like oh that's foreign language i don't understand it i had a mexican friend once he went to barcelona and he just insisted he couldn't understand anything he couldn't understand a word of catalan and i was like how is that possible you're a native spanish speaker i mean it's there's how can you not understand but he, he wasn't it was the same thing that i gave the example the other guy I found the bus was always late he said the bus is never late i mean it's, it, that was his experience you know his his mind's like, oh, I don't understand what they're saying. Therefore, I shut it out. And now I can't understand. Yeah. So I think that was the other thing, too. I mean, I can't understand how anybody, I mean, English has borrowed more words directly from French than yes. from any other language. I can't see how any native English speaker could look at pretty much any French text. And if I say, okay, what is this text about? And you could say, I have no idea. You know, if you take the time to look at the page, there are going to be so words there. You, you can't not know what it's saying. Yeah, I've had that experience, actually. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what was that? Uh, was it Christopher, I think? I'm sorry. I thought somebody okay. else was going to say something. Uh, no, no, no. I was just agreeing. But, yeah. But you, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, no, I was, um, I was, I had that same experience, like, in the last few uh, weeks or months. I've been just kind of, how do you say searching around in other languages that I don't know, just doing some uh, search searches for resources in there just to see what they have. 
And literally in French, I'll just translate the, the phrase into French, look up some pages of French, and you know, I can get the general gist of what's being said without having studied a lick, literally not a lick of French. Uh, I mean, obviously details, all that, nothing, but yes. And, and you didn't need 50 hours, and that wasn't on par with learning to read Hindi or no. Russian, like Paul says. Hindi, <laughs> Russian, and French. Yeah. Hindi, Russian, and French. <laughs> <laughs> so so those were some of your things. Oh, so I found that a bit more bizarre. Um, so I wonder if, you know, if Hall were really pressed on those comparisons that he made with you, you know, and maybe he was just sleepy, you know, when he made them, you know, I don't know how much he really stick to them, but, you know, the comparison between Russian and Hindi, I found a little more bizarre because, I mean, the Cyrillic alphabet is, you know, not that different to Latin yeah, alphabet. No. I mean, they share a common ancestor, whereas, you know, the Dave Nagati mm. writing system is just, you know, completely different. Yeah, yep. that, yeah, that, that, that struck me too, even to equate those doesn't really make sense. But again, it's the same thing. I think he's he's not necessarily talking from his his professional linguist perspective, but from you know your your average language learner perspective. And yeah, for an average language learner, you know, Russian, well, the, everything's funny and that's like backwards and these other things. So it, it's you know, I, it does it strikes us as you know as a sister, a cousin alphabet. But for your normal person, it's it's pretty bizarre. What other interesting things did Hall have to say in chapters 17, 18, and 19 that we should talk about in any sort of systematic way before we get carried off into our own directions? Is there any sort of concluding thoughts that we want to have or think any hanging questions left from either your own your own minds or the, the comments in this, in this section? Uh, there was, was one. I know, uh, Professor, you disagreed vehemently with his claim that uh, interlinear texts are useless. But he, I don't remember him actually going into much detail as to why. He just described them as being worse than useless. Mm -hmm. You know, they shortcut the learning process, but uh, he didn't give any description as to how that was the case. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, what, yeah. what were your thoughts on that? Well, he wasn't talking about interlinear texts in the fashion that um, we, uh, that have come up several times in some of the discussions that were popular at a certain point in the 19th century when, you know, rather than having now as, as Asimil has bilingual text columns, there are interlinear texts, you can actually purchase them. And it's like one, one line of Latin and right underneath it, the exact translation into to English. He's not talking about that. He's talking about in your own textbook, making, you know, writing notes underneath it. And oh, okay. I, don't, I don't know why he's saying that those are so useless, but, you know, if it's small and messy, I mean, frankly speaking, every so often I have found, you know, if, if you find a, a used textbook and the person that had it before you was a serious student, that's just, that's helpful. I mean, you've got the things there if you can read the handwriting. Um, and I myself have made interlinear texts without like, being conscious that I was doing, but yeah, just being aware that, well, this is too small, so I've got to make a photocopy of it, and then I've got a larger page, and it's got more space, and I don't have to write in every word, but I can write in the words that I don't know, and then when I go back and review it, it's, in essence, it's an interlinear text, so um, mm -hmm. he just seemed like he was being a bit cranky there, uh, saying that these are, these are worse than useless. Other thoughts about his, uh, some of the ideas that came up in, in these chapters as I talked about them or that struck you, I think you all probably read it or looked at it or something. Why, yeah, why so does it need, Matthew? Go ahead, go ahead. why does it need to be a really kind of uh, um, uh, fervent, enthusiastic woman who gets these conversation clubs or tables going? I don't know. <laughs> Like, come on, know. you stop talking about that like a, a moderator, like uh -huh. <laughs> to chastise them. <laughs> I don't know. What else? William, you mean about to say something? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was going to talk about this anyways, but I saw an interesting comment of Ryan Smallwood. He talks about the digital, digital flashcard systems, like Anki, for example. Uh, you you said in your last video that you didn't like the those and you presented your your ideas about it about technology in general right not just Anki but I I I think that your your ideas about technology are pretty much on point for a uh, self self called technophobe as you said yourself those are very pertinent questions so someone should ask when they mm -hmm. do when they go around learning on internet or using technology to learn a language 
but he says a lot of things that I agree. For example, in flashcards, you can put audio. So you never create weird speaking habits because you're gonna hear the words correctly. And you can put also the IPA transcription. You can put the, the yeah. translation, <clears throat> all of those in Anki. And I agree. I myself use Anki, not too much, but I used on the 2000 most, most basic words. It's fantastic. Once you do 2,000 words, everything you, you look, you understand at least something. It's, it's fantastic mm -hmm. when you do this. It's boring. I don't think it's, it's good to go as much as Ryan says. Like he says, oh, do this. He doesn't say, for, he doesn't say here, but I get uh -oh. the idea. <laughs> He's, he wants to do it forever. Like, oh, if you want to learn a language, do Anki, do Anki, do Anki. I, I myself think different. Like, I think do 2,000 words first, um, the most important grammar that comes with those, those 2,000 words, and then just go to other places. And then you're going to find a lot more comprehensible input. Then you just go in zero words. Let me find some comprehensible input. That's super hard to find in my experience. Uh, well, what, what I was saying there is, I mean, I... There are different strokes for different folks. If you like memorizing vocabulary, if you like doing something mm -hmm. like that, if you want to do that, that's that's fine. I've never found that to be useful or helpful on 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 flashcards, you know, paper flashcards. And yeah. so, if I don't find that useful on paper flashcards, why am I going to want to surrender my control of the learning process to some digital form? I mean, so to me, that has nothing to offer. And people are always asking, "What do you think about it?" And it's like. I don't think anything about it. I don't. It's just, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if, if it, you like it, it is what it is. It is what it yeah. is. Whatever if you is. like it, go ahead and do it. I don't, you know, I don't like it. So I, I don't see the point of that. The only time I was like really considered using any kind of flashcard was um, learning Hanja for Korean. Um, the, the, the government ministry I sort of tells people like it's very similar to what you were just saying, William. There are about 2,000 that, you know, are basic and standard and you're supposed to learn them. And if you can do that, you have the foundation in reading others. But I found very swiftly um, that, you know, the, I, just looking at them and, you know, going through this, that, that didn't, I mean, you, I needed to write them out. Writing them out is what yeah. fixes them in your memory. So I didn't see any, I've never, I've never used a flashcards to, to any degree in any way, shape or form. So, um, yeah. Bruce, but there is an alternate way of using Anki that's quite popular nowadays. So instead of using, you know, instead of using it to review isolated words and phrases, um, there's this idea of, you know, sentence mining. You, you know, you have content that you're familiar with that's meaningful to you. And instead of extracting the words from them, you extract the sentences. You basically review the sentences instead of the words. So you get kind of like a mini package deal. You know, you get the phrase, the word itself, the, the, the pattern, essentially. And uh, there's that oh, website, Antimoon. It was uh, run by those two Polish learners of English who, yeah, I guess, yeah. pioneered that approach. And then it was you know, picked up by that other website, um, all Japanese all the time. And it's been kind of refined over time. But uh, that is quite a popular way of using uh, it. Is that but, why? Uh, is that why the, uh, I mean, probably if you purchase the entire package of the, 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 this, when you get it, the audio will have a, a, a flash drive with it. Yeah, it'll yeah. not just have like oh. you know, the CD of the lesson. It'll have it sentence by sentence by sentence. And I, I, I've never known what to do with that. Is that what it's yeah. for? Yeah. You can take it. Yeah, I, 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 think so, I think so. Yeah. Call it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think it is. I mean, the thing with Anki too is, you know, it's it's a good servant, but it can be a terrible master because if they, you, it's kind of like this magical black box. You know, you just stick a bunch of stuff in it, and you just you know that defer to the algorithm, and then it tells you what to learn. But the problem is, you know, you just, you can be, you can just spiral out of control. You can add 50 cards a day before you know it, you've got 200 reviews in the morning. And then if you're sick, you know, and you're off for a week and you wake up, you've got 700 reviews. Oh my God. Uh, good May I talk more time. about that? That's a great lad. Yes, please, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, since people started uh, mentioning about the, the anti-moon side, the our Japanese all the time side, uh, I I look a little bit into them because you know I've learned a little bit of Japanese and I'm finally reading. Thank the Lord, I'm finally reading. It took so much time, but anyways, mm. um, it, they talk so much about this idea of sentence mining, 
because it's all about the comprehensible input. What crashing says, because they always take off from crashing. They took the base idea from crashing, the comprehensible input. What crashing says, that is really easy to find comprehensible input and boring, that's a school. And it's easy, it's easy to find compelling content and super difficult, that's the native content. The really difficult is to find one that's both compelling and comprehensive, right? So what the people from Entimon, right? People from, from our Japanese all the time, all those people think, well, what you need to do is plow through the boring content. How you do it? Get those sentences, preferably the ones that you like, right? Get those sentences, mm -hmm. repeat them until you, un until you remember them. So then you can go around to native content, right? And start learning from there. And then continue using Anki. Continue using Anki, revising the words you don't know or the grammar you don't know. I'm not 100% I'm not with this idea. I still think that Anki gets a lot boring, especially as Christopher said, if you put a lot of cards a day, Things snowball in a sense, but Anki is good because I don't know if everyone uh, everyone here heard about Ebbinghaus and he's forgetting mm. curve. The idea of Anki is exactly that. They use an algorithm to say, oh, according to Ebbinghaus, you're going to forget in this day here. So I'm going to show this information again, so don't forget. So it's basically, it's based on the idea of Herman Ebbinghaus and his curve of forgetting. So it's based by science. It's not just oh random ideas that someone thought. That forgetting like curve always... you can apply it to any studying though, right? Hmm? The no, forgetting it's... curve, you can apply it to any kind of forgetting. It's not just yes, yes, but testing every yourself house on. used for words. That's why <laughs> the the people especially used for this because Abby House was trying to drill words that made no sense, right? They say, oh. If you try to draw words that make no sense, therefore, if you're trying to draw words that make sense, mm -hmm. it's going to be even easier for you. In that house. Why do you want to learn um, words, uh, though, in isolation? I've never really understood that, William, what you were saying earlier. If you can find, you know, four languages that have enough resources to say, okay, we know we've identified the 2,000 or 3,000 most common words. And then I think if they've gone to that extent, ideally, there'll be some sort of reader that incorporates these into some sort of text. And then by reading and working with that, that text, as you said, it might be a simple and somewhat boring one. Um, but just sort of taking words and, and isolation and trying to learn them, I don't know why, I've never understood why people want to do that, but people like to do that. No, no, not the isolation, doctor. In sentences, 3,000 sentences, 2,000 sentences. It's boring, mm -hmm. but it works. That's the idea. Uh, generally, I will say, in my experience um, with with Mandarin, I'm sorry, can it? Yeah, that's right. Okay, my audio mm -hmm. showing up. Sorry. Uh, in my experience with Mandarin, um, and just reflecting on the language learning process, uh, Professor, I, I will say that now, how can I say? two principles that I have found to be true uh, so far with Mandarin and so far with Russian is that in general with languages, the more context, the better for anything. And that is why, yes, in general, um, learning, like the, the less context you have for what you're learning, I think the more dangerous that is for building bad habits. So but learning with sentences better than learning individual words, especially the most common words, especially the most common words. And if possible, learning them, pulling those sentences from full text or learning just from full text, you know, repeating what you're doing, uh, repeating, you know, going back and going back to those lessons and reviewing them a week or two later. That's also fine. What I, what I kind of envision with uh, the second, I'm sorry, the second principle that I often adhere to is that you should practice your main practice, your main language learning activities, the bread and butter, the meat should be the activities that you want to be good in, like practice what you want to get 
good at doing, right? So if you want to get, if you want to have good reading skills, you know, start reading from the beginning, maybe not literature, right? Because depending on the language, that could be very hard, but start reading from the beginning, start listening from the beginning. And um, we haven't talked about his book yet, but I, I recommend it. And I think some people may have seen, I think Matthew, you saw in Nation's terminology, Paul Nation's terminology, when he talks about language, I know I'm sorry, meaning focused input and meaning focused output. So reading, listening, speaking, and writing about things that you are comprehensible and that are interesting to you. I, I honestly believe a person, assuming you had the resources, let's assume you're learning a language with the resources. If you just literally listen, read to things you understood and were interested in, and then had the opportunities, ability to read and write about things that you were uh, interested in, that, that, that is enough. You could just do literally those four activities and that would be enough. Why we add in things like grammatical study using flashcards or a nation also has fluency activities, speed reading, these kinds of things is to, is to speed up that natural uh, in, in language acquisition, right? Reading, writing, uh, reading, listening, speaking, writing. Like our brains, I do agree with uh, Crash and on this, I do believe our brains are somewhat hardwired to learn languages and those four activities by themselves are enough. But doing things like, um, yeah, you, you yourself, scriptorium, shadowing, um, pronunciation study, grammatical study, flashcards. I have used flashcards. Um, I, I, I do think that line by Christopher a second ago was perfect. They can be very much misused and they can go crazy very, very, very quickly. Uh, and, and <laughs> You've got insane flashcards in your house. <laughs> yes, yes. They, they, they really, honestly, most of the time they are misused and I think that they grow out of proportion and people forget, yes, hey, you if you're doing spending all your time with flashcards, you're not reading or listening to the language or in the, or, that's not exactly true, but you know what I mean? You're not, you're not doing the things you want to get better at. You're losing perspective there, I think. Yeah. So I think, I think there is a kind of risk of, you know, like mission creep, you know, where you, you're supposed to treat something like Anki as a supplement, but you know, because people can go overboard with it, they end up just spending all of their time on it. You know, I know even from people who've had really good success with it, they uh, described yeah. going through periods where it was just, it was basically like a kind of hell. You know, they just wake up to 300 views, like, well, that's that's my day, half my day gone. You know, and then you know, again, if you're sick, you know, you, you, you've got to play catch up constantly. You know? So it can really get the better so, of you. Kind of take over. Is that like the modern? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Matthew. Go ahead, Matthew. Yeah. I was saying we just went over about 10 points that uh, I have something to say about. Um, <laughs> right. Um, I'll try to be specific here. Um, William, when you're talking about context, like, for example, if, if, if I see like a modern day kind of communicative kind of language lesson and the teacher just writes a full sentence on the board and says, all right, we're going to explain that today, then I would say that <laughs> sentence was introduced out of context. There was no, it came from nothing. What, where did it come from before you put it on the board? And I've used Anki before to learn the first, after about the first thousand words in Mandarin, I took the 5,000 word HSK list and I just worked through that over a period of months and it wasn't fun. And I just told myself if I could do that, then I'll just start reading and it will work. It didn't, I couldn't read really well, or I would read. You learned 5,000 most common words and you could not read. I could read. Yeah, I could read. But I mean, um, as far as following the discourse of what's happening on the page, yeah, it, I yeah. couldn't do yeah, it yeah. really well. Um, yeah. Yes. But I still had much better Mandarin than almost anyone I any foreigner I ran into. But um, OK, um, the thing that I found and, and, and the flashcards were made for me. Um, the only time I found flashcards to be really uh, useful for me is if I made them myself and I did make a yeah. big stack of Arabic uh, mm -hmm. cards and I didn't think it would work for that actually because I didn't think it was very phonetic <laughs> but it did um, 
but um, then I got too many of them and then it didn't become fun anymore. Um, but I guess making them works, but using sentences is good because it has prosody there instead of just focusing on the one word. Mm -hmm. You were talking about Paul Nation, Chase. Um, Paul Nation also, he's like, if you're a teacher, right? So if you're a teacher, then what should you do to like, what changes could you make? Here are the top five changes. The number one would be to add the meaning focus strand because if they're not yeah, getting graded yeah. readers or getting comprehensible input, then it's assuming that you're already doing language focused learning, like studying, learning about grammar, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, so add that strand in there. Once that's there, add some meaning focus output. So they're kind of using it. I, he also says that just like the meaning focused input as in reading or listening, like the growth you experience from that, it's much slower than language focused learning. Like it's still there, but it's yeah. like uh, yes. much slower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, that's, all, that's all I had to say. <laughs> okay. Just, just on the oh, sorry. Just, oh, go ahead, Will. Okay, okay. Um, so, some thoughts. I think I think Chase about talked about you. You need to train what you need to to want to be good at, and to a certain point, it's good, unless you're mm -hmm. talking about output. If you want to output, yes, be it writing, be it, uh, be it uh, speaking, yes. you do need to to first get the yes. input. You first yes. need to get the input. Uh, there, William. I, this is I, I complete. This is one area. Uh, where language, you're correct. And I think language, this is one area where language is different from almost any other skill that I can think of. Uh, I, you have to have reading and listening at a high or at a certain level before you want to start trying to speak or write. Produce yes. your own thoughts, but well, that's what I mean by speaking and writing. Producing so, yes, original yes. ideas. I, in that regard, I William, could you, tell us, could you tell us, seriously, I mean, I can't tell when I read your comments that you're not a native English speaker. It doesn't jump out at me that, you know, this is being written by somebody who's doing this as a, as a foreign language. Can you tell us how you got to that point? By uh, your initial comments of learning English by using Google Translate, what do you mean? You would just write a Portuguese sentence in there and take the English and, and use that? Well, what do you mean? How did you do that? That's, that's a good question, right? Um, the doctor <laughs> touched exactly the main point. What it means to learn a language. Let's get first to this point. Um, mm. But what I mean by getting to learn a language, because you can learn a language forever if you want. That's, that's not really an issue. What I mean is getting conversation, get those 5,000 words that Paul Nation says mm. that you are able to understand any native material with, can understand basically everything. Sometimes you miss one word or another, but that word does not make your overall understanding bad. You understand right. the overall, the overall gist of everything. Mm -hmm. How I did this? Um, I think most of people that are here and also seeing this video, they get the first contact with foreign languages on school, right? So I started getting, getting graded on English grammar. So that was not fun, I gotta say. That was not fun, but it impacted me in a sense. That's why till today I get those 2000 words on sentences. I don't get them out of context and drill them because mm. even though school was super boring, it never get anything out of it. But it gave me the mm. base idea of grammar. It gave me base idea. Mm. So what I did, I when I was younger, I'm I'm still young, but when I was younger, I loved to play <laughs> games. I love to play games. And if you don't know, most of the games, especially the electronic ones, they're in English. And I always yeah. said, oh, you know what? I'm going to use Spanish because Spanish is almost Portuguese. Right? They're too much close to each other. So I played. And there were times that Spanish was completely different. I couldn't understand this. And I continued playing many games. And I said, you know what? Let me learn some English. And what I did, I put the game window in a, in a side of the computer 
In the other side, I put the Google Translate. Whenever I saw a sentence I didn't knew, I typed it out. And then I translate word by word the sentence. I translated word by word. And then I understood because I had the context of the game. I had the context of the game. I could understand what was happening, right? And I did this many, 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 many times. And I started watching YouTube as well in English. And I started looking for subtitles, um, English videos of subtitles. And there is a lot of them. There's a lot. If, mm -hmm. if someone that is listening doesn't really get what we're talking about, go listen to some YouTube videos with transcripts. There's a lot of them out there. There's a lot. And one day I decided, you know what? Because I was always doing this process, like, oh, I, this word I don't know. Let me translate that specific word. I keep mm. kept doing this, doing, 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 till they say, so, mm. you know what? Let me test here. Let me take off the subtitles. Because I had a friend, he always boasts about, you know what? I watch English without subtitles. Uh, nowadays, looking back, that was pretty stupid when you think about it, someone boasting about understanding <laughs> a language. But anyways, <laughs> we were young at that time. So we thought, oh, yes, that's the final barrier. Let's learn English just by hearing. And that was the last time I, I used subtitles. And it's good because even my, my brother, he also learned English, but mm. he learned not by text how I did, right? I even got some scientific tests because I thought, you know what? I want to have highly scientific discussions in English. So let me get some scientific papers and start translating. And I never had um, audio. That's the big problem. I never had audio. So now and then I still find a word that I don't know how to pronounce. So let me go back to Google Translate and put that word there so I can hear how people pronounce mm. the word. So I, to today, I still use Google Translate for those specific situations. They don't happen that much anymore because mostly I use Oxford Dick at this point in time. Like most of this Oxford Dick. Mm -hmm. And since there, since I had this time, no problem happened. So that's really interesting. You're a perfect illustration of, of Hall's point here about you know, learning the language in context. Uh, to the, game, the context is your gaming, uh, playing a game, and it gave you some... Uh, active interest and need to, to do in that. So that's case case closed here for the for the main point that he's making. Um, Christopher, you, thought, you wanted to say something a little while ago? Oh, no, was just, this was just the, um, you know, when we were talking about learning isolated vocabulary, I was just, you know, be interesting to get people's thoughts, whether you think there's any value in doing that for, you know, specifically small sets of vocabulary, like for example, Korean kinship terms or something. Like, is there a particular way uh -huh other than just kind of, you know, I guess brute forcing it, because, you know, it's not a huge amount of right. vocabulary. I don't know how many terms there are in Korean, but it's not, uh, you know, you're not learning thousands of words in those kinds of situations. I'm about um, ready to do that for Persian, uh, for Farsi, the, the months of the year, because that, those are the names of the Zodiac, right? I just, I just can't remember them. <laughs> Yeah. For, key, for Korean kinship terms, there's so many that, I mean, it truly is a case when, you know, every relationship has a different term. And there was a time when, um, when I, you know, when my, when my wife's younger sister's family was coming to visit us, and we lived in Singapore. So I knew the name for my wife's younger sister, what I was supposed to call her, but I, I didn't know what I was supposed to call my brother-in-law. My wife didn't know either. She, I mean, she couldn't, she couldn't think of it, you know, what, what, you know, she knew what she would call him, but what should I call him? And so we had to ask her mother, you know, so my mother-in-law, it's like, you know, my wife is a native Korean. It's like, there were, uh, I think might be this might be that, you know, she's just like, wasn't sure. So I don't think there's any point in learning all of those Chinese. and the abstract, you should just learn the ones you need because there is no, there's no word for brother-in-law. I mean, there's right. a word my my wife's right. younger sister's husband there's a wife yeah. or you know, there's there's yeah. they're all different um it's interesting I mean, does the brother-in-law know how he's supposed to be addressed or does he just expect that 
could be some. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You know, because I'm, his, I, 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 because I'm I'm older than him, and because I'm his wife's older sister's husband, I think he has to take whatever I call him. He might not like it. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's that's yeah. I hey, don't know. Related, somewhat related to this topic. Um, is not uh, about so this is one of the questions i had when i was going back and um making some questions about discussions from the past and mm -hmm. um nicely this relates to the topic chris just brought up and it was about i got it from the discussion the first discussion with uh, william and matthew so when you guys had your mm -hmm. first discussion and it has to do with you guys were talking about growing your vocabulary at intermediate and advanced levels which is a, uh, it, this is a serious problem for non-Indo-European languages and yeah, uh, seriously for non-Indo-European languages because um, what I believe will happen, say in the future, or not believe, right now with Russian, I'm already learning Russian and I'm saying with Russian, oh wow, I'm getting so many cognates. I, I keep in mind, you know, coming from Mandarin, I'm getting so many words that I already know in Russian, right? And so what I believe will is the case that will happen when you're learning a pretty similar language like English to French or, um, or if say I were going from right now from Mandarin to Cantonese is that once you get to that intermediate level or so, the hardest part vocabulary wise, speaking of vocabulary, the hardest part has been, the hardest peak has been surmounted. The hardest peak is the, is the common everyday language. That is, those are gonna be most of the new words. What you need to do once you reach literacy, starting to get into literacy is you need to refine, uh, refine your language. And while there will be many, what do you call it? False cognates, many words that look alike, but you need to actually learn differences that's kind of swamped that's kind of swamped by the the enormous amount of words which you get essentially for free going off but with non-indo-european languages um or languages that don't share a, a a mother what do you call it like english isn't latin's daughter language but it took a lot of vocabulary from it a common lexical source you that intermediate and advanced vocabulary has no you're still having to build it up. So with that said, the question was, um, especially for languages whose word building system is highly transparent and internally consistent, for example, Mandarin, Russian, Greek, Arabic, um, would it be more helpful to focus on learning word roots at the intermediate level rather than individual words? I can, I can speak about this a little bit. I'm learning Japanese. Japanese has a lot mm -hmm. of this because it comes from Mandarin. And I'm learning ancient Greek that it does have this system. And uh, I mean, yes, you may learn some, the, the root words, it's good, but never learn the root words just, just in vacuum. Learn the root words yes. in other words. Because for mm -hmm. example, uh, let me get a word that, it's not from ancient Greek because my ancient Greek is not that good. But let me get a word that came from ancient Greek. For example, um, chronodendrology. I don't know if you ever heard about this word. Yeah. Have you ever heard chronodendrology? chronodendrology. Time and trees. <laughs> yeah. 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 For example, this word, if you, there's three parts of it. There's chrono, that means time, right? Dendro, that is, means tree. And logi, mm -hmm. that means study. So the study right. of uh, the three times you know, around the, right. this idea. What chronodendrology is, basically they date things based on, on the age of the trees that were cut to make that, that thing. Basically mm -hmm. what they do. I, I'm not an expert on it. I just saw the word and I was learning. Right. To say, yes, this is a perfect word. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, that's why you should learn in this way, you never should learn a, a list of suffixes or a list of prefixes. Yes. This is super boring. This is super boring. Yes. It does a disservice mm -hmm. to the language. 
It ties mm. to the idea of comprehensible input and compelling. You, it's comprehensive, mm. yes, but it's super boring. But when you see, oh, yes, I can use this knowledge. I can learn. Hence why, for example, my Latin has become a lot worse than my Greek because my Greek has become a lot more useful than my Latin in learning right. new words, for example. Mm. I can always see more, more words that came from Greek, but not so much from Latin. Right. I think Chase did. Um, uh, Rob, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say for Chase, because so, you're studying Russian, um, you mentioned you're learning word groups. There's a book. Um, that's probably not going to show oh, you. I have that. That's how, you know that book? <laughs> oh, you got that? Really, yeah. really, really, really how, how do you use and, it? Funny because... enough, funny enough, Wait, no, your... funny, uh, uh, well, how I use it, um, well, once funny, when they told one little anecdote, is, I actually, I was looking in ch for resources to learn Russian and Chinese. So I'm using mostly Chinese resources, Chinese-based language resources to learn Russian. And I came across, I was like, oh, hey, look, roots of the Russian language. Uh, this Chinese book sounds interesting. I can use it to complement this English book, right? By George, by what's his name? And then I get the book and it's, it's by some, I forget, Huang something, some, 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 and I open the book up and it is just literally like a translation. Like these guys just translated. It, it's literally total just like words. Yeah. Total knockoff, like sentence for <laughs> sentence. I'm like, are you kidding me? Is this legal? Okay. Yeah. But anyway, anyways. Um, but I, I think I have I'll, an older I'll, version I'll, of that. I was going to jump up and get mine the way you jumped it to get yours, but it's in another room and I don't know. But there's I, there, for Russian, there are several that are like that. So mm -hmm. um, I would still say, I, I think a better piece of advice would be, uh, again, what you're saying, when you get to the intermediate level and more advanced level, the problem is that precisely because the words there to continue building, they're rarer. They don't occur as often yeah. as other things. So rather than trying to learn roots or some other system or something, every author has his own favorite words or use of words. So I think mm -hmm. it's a better piece of advice to say, I might want to read more widely, but let me stick to, you know, let me read an author that has, you know, a, a big opus to begin with and stick with that right. in multiple books because right. that's the only way you'll see those words come back um, time and time, time again enough for them to stick once they stick then you don't have a problem forgetting them and you can use them to build other things but if you don't you know if you're just going to read this word and see it once and then look it up or look study in a root dictionary and then go to another author and meet his intermediate and advanced vocabulary it's going to take a longer time right like, like in your experience with um with Arabic, instead of I remember in um the videos you had with your former colleague um when you were talking about literature, for instance, like you you never felt the need at the intermediate advanced levels to systematically you know go through the roots and kind of uh, brute force memorize them. You just chose maybe yeah. you stuck with like what's his name Nagiba. Najib Mahfouz. Najib Mahfouz. Like you from right? mm -hmm. and then just read several books from him, and then you grew comfortable. You know, you grew comfortable with the style. You wanted to read somebody else, so you went to Ibra Ibrahim. I forget. Ibrahim Nasrallah. Thank you, Ibrahim Nasrallah. <laughs> right, and then you would read a few books from him. <laughs> Sorry, my, mm -hmm. hopefully in a few years I can have the pronunciation, but not. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then you read a few books from him, and then yeah, you just that's when the vocabulary starts to snowball. Mm -hmm. that's when you can. Yeah, exactly. And, and then you can always just stay with Thousand and One Nights. That would, that's, a, that's a beautiful place to stay. Ah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. um, let's go back to make sure we do total justice to Hall's book. We have these three final chapters. So we've been talking about language and context. That's what I talked about mostly. But then he also goes on to audiovisual things, which is where, you know, I pointed out that, you know, that's my, you know, that's, that's his pre-computer era and looking at these kind of things here and that his final mm -hmm. um, sort of analysis of the value of the linguistic approach. Um, I think I noticed that, you know, somebody, other people noticed too, that in particular, like in the, in the, in the preceding section where he was saying, okay, I'm gonna point out the problems you can find and then I'm gonna offer some solutions. He didn't really offer that many solutions. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, he's good at pointing out problems, but he says he's offering solutions, but he didn't really do all that much. I tried to provide some. And then also, I mean, um, I mean, yes, I think his 
the book is valuable and so I think that just the, the overall applicability of the linguistic approach as he talks about it, how, how valid do you all feel that is? I mean, I, I, I do think that it goes back to, I guess it's my argument, not his, that mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about earlier, that, that the, the more reasons you have for studying a language, the more likely you are to succeed in it. So likewise here, the, the better you understand what you're dealing with, um, the better you are, the more likely you are to, 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 to be able to, to tame it or to come to terms with it or to work with it. Mm -hmm. And I do think that there are a lot of people out there who um, don't, uh, as, as pointed out in the school system, you know, it's just like, okay, you have to pass this test. You have to do this. They don't do any, right. any yeah. context, any value of the language. And I think a lot of those quote unquote normal learners that just want to communicate, it's like, hey, I just want to know this. I just, yeah, I don't, I don't care about it, about learning about this. I just want to like go and get my needs met. I want to like be able to like talk and, and say what I want and have people, they don't have to respect me, but they have to like give me the food that I want. So when you when that sort of re reduce it to that level, um, you know, it's yeah. I, I don't think people are going to have that much success. So uh, I don't know. What what did you think of the of the concluding chapter? I mean, I I did not understand what he was talking about exactly about the linguistic approach, but I think it's about grammar analysis around those lines. I'm not really certain. So. To a certain point, yes, to a certain point, because you at least want to be able to say, this is good, this bad, this is bad for me. So some very basic phrases, right? I, I hungry, I want food, something around those lines you need to say, right? So it, it's really difficult for an adult, maybe a kid would get it, but it's maybe it is very difficult for an adult saying those basic words without at least understanding, oh, I is the pronoun, um, hungry is the adjective, something up on those basic lines, right? Don't go around saying, oh, the syntax of the sentences, uh, or let's conjugate all the, all the possible conjugations of the, the, the verbs, let's learn reg irregular verbs. Yeah, those ideas, I think uh, they are also too much. They're getting too much. But in the basic ideas, I don't think you need to just discard grammar altogether. I think you need to at least learn the basic. Like, what is a <clears throat> noun? How you say something is mine? How say something is from someone else? Right? I'll say those things. Not really focus on the grammar terms or how those relate to the language so on, but how they do it. That's basically it. Well, he, he does do a nice sort of, you know, uh, nice professorial trick. He, he lays out his terms in the beginning. He defines language as being uh, oral, auditory, systemic, based on context. And he goes through it and comes back to that at the end. And he says that. And again, I just think that uh, the basic point is saying is if you keep all of that in mind, um, Rather than just taking a phrase book approach and saying, "Here, I want to, I want to be able to say this, 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 and this," um, mm -hmm. you're more likely to succeed. And I think uh, somebody read a quote, Chris. I think was, you read the quote that, that somebody said pointed out that, yeah, it, it is just a sad fact that most people who set out to learn a language give up, stop, don't, you know, don't succeed. Uh, and you see that time and time again, and, you, and it goes even further. As you said, maybe you forget what does it mean to succeed? As William pointed out, you can go on forever learning. You know, you see it in any institutional language program. I mean, the the first semester of the first year has a large number, and then you have fewer and fewer people as you got more and more advanced. So, if you want to succeed, then you need to have other. You need to have a, a, a better understanding. I mean, it gets back to the whole ideas of, 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 of polyliteracy. I mean, in a philosophical sense, you have to respect and know what language is if you hope to succeed. And if you go back to some sort of platonic dialogue, you can't, you know, the, the, the basic, you know, most people saying, well, I just, I want to be able to say something. Well, if you're going to use your tongue, you need to use your head and your head is part of your body and your body only works if your soul is in order. So let's get your soul in order and then, you're, then you'll be able to say things better. 
I think that's well, sort of the lines of what Hall is talking about, saying if you respect the, the true nature of, of language, then you'll have a better chance of, of, of succeeding when you go out to learn a foreign language. Christopher, you look like you've got a big comment or question mark. No, I mean, there's a lot of stuff there. I mean, it's, it's yeah, I mean, you've got a, <laughs> a real vested interest and it's, it's, it's hard to come. And certainly in a classroom setting. I mean, I remember back on the forum uh, many years ago, you mentioned that you know, students that took, I don't know if the, 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 the link available, but you said the students that took Spanish, there was a higher attrition rate in the Spanish class than in, say, the Japanese class. Because the people that took Spanish were taking it just for easy credits, whereas the people that took, mm. you know, quite difficult language like you know, mm -hmm. Japanese, Chinese, there was, you know, they, they were prepared in a sense for what they were going to encounter. So there was a higher, you know, degree of or higher likelihood that they would succeed. So yeah, I guess the question is, how do you kindle that interest? And it's. it's I think you, know, you flipped that. I think you flipped that around. Now that you jarred my memory. I was talking about my experience in Korea when Korean kids all think Japanese is easy, so they sign up for Japanese because they think that they're going to, you know, get in, you know, they don't have to work. It'll be easy. Something this does. So at the university where I taught in Korea, if I recall, they had like five sections of, of Japanese 101, and then. You know, <laughs> Yeah, after this, whereas Spanish only had one section of Spanish 101, but also it's pretty much the same size. Everybody signed up for Spanish. If you're, if you're Korean, Spanish is hard. And you know that going into right. it, so you can do it. Whereas if you, if you just say, well, oh, I've got, I've, I'm majoring in, in, in international studies and they say I have to have, you know, a year of a foreign language. Well, Japanese is easy. I'm signing up for Japanese. Oh, this isn't so easy. I still have to work at it. I'm not interested. I'm out. Um, so I think there, yeah. You can't remember, I do remember that. Interesting, doctor, that you have all those experiences. In my experience, it was different. On school, we have both Spanish and English. I, I wasn't super bad at English, no. I, I was okay. I could pass. But Spanish, I, it was so easy for me. I liked so much Spanish, and I still don't understand why I didn't go to Spanish today, because it was super easy for me because i guess the language proximity so say that people drop me out of those it strikes strikes me as odd maybe it was because at that time i was the best of the class i don't know i don't know why but it was easy for me it was easy for me spanish and i kept to the end i try try to get out from english though <laughs> because i thought well, it was too hard for me but i kept to the end i kept to the end mm. Well, you're a little different as a learner from the ones who gave up with Spanish, probably, right? Because you've mm -hmm. made it this far with language learning. Mm -hmm. I think I need to give up on uh, Japanese then, and then I will get the <laughs> Japanese forever. <laughs> That's the only way, I guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know what actually. Uh, that does touch actually on um, a question to um, related kind of to. Uh, what you were just talking about, Professor, uh, what William just talked upon. And I, I wanted to ask all, all of you guys maybe, um, because how is it? so all of us, if we've all caught kind of polyitis, people who are just interested in, we'll say Hall's, who would agree with most of Hall's linguistic approach or most of his ideas, or certainly a large, large majority of them um, about, Yes, I think that's a maxim, what you just said about the, what is it? You have a better chance of succeeding in learning if you want to know, how would you say, if you want to know what you're learning about, if you want mm -hmm. to know language, right? You don't just want to use it. You want to, you're interested in language itself. You know, what is language? I can understand that more by going out and learning languages. And um and hopefully also having a cultural interest in them as well. The more, I think that's the other maxim is more reasons you have for learning. Yes, I, I think that's so fundamental just to be a maxim. The more reasons you have for learning, the more um, chance you have of succeeding. And what I wanted to ask was, uh, all of you, all, all you other guys have kind of, so, so, so far the only two languages before Mandarin and Russian that I started were both in school, like you guys. And so I, I know the reason I did not get to a high level in them was because yes, they were forced on me. Um, but in my self-directed study so far, I only 
really gave up Spanish. And that was just because of life circumstances dropping down and me getting a job in China. And so I focused all my attention on Chinese. And that's, yeah. And so I wanted to kind of ask to other, to you guys who maybe have started, it sounds like from hearing Christopher's story and Matthew's story, and I believe also yours as well, William. And of course, Professor, you're you know, famous for this. You had to cut languages down because you're overextending yourself too far. Assuming that you do have a strong multiple motivations for multiple languages, how do you determine which of those you really still want to take to that higher level? Why was it Arabic and Korean and uh, for you, Professor, Arabic and Korean and uh, French, Spanish, German, and for you, Christopher, French and German were your first two. And uh, Matthew, I believe you said Spanish, right? Was your strongest one? Yeah, probably is right now. Maybe not. Yeah. yeah. Okay, fair, fair enough, fair enough. But and William, with your English, like what from the other languages you guys studied, why was it, why, why did your strong languages become your strong languages? Because I'm assuming you had motivation for many, many others, right? But why were those the ones that kind of rose to the top? This is an issue I'm worried about because I don't want to overextend myself mm -hmm. if I can avoid yeah. that. If yeah, don't do it to begin with and then you don't need to cut back. Christopher, you sound like you stayed pretty loyal to your first two loves. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, the German, I mean, it was all, it's all kind of accidental ultimately. I mean, uh, I mean, German and French were actually obligatory subjects in high school. And I know I took uh, a year of French initially and I forgot I mean, successfully forgot everything. I took Latin as well. Uh, I mean, German, uh, I mean, again, I had a great teacher. He was just you know, like a friend to all the students, you know, and I still keep mm -hmm. in contact with them. So, I mean, he, you know, there was, there was a class in which I just absorbed everything. But, uh, you know, I had a large mm -hmm. interest in music as well. And so, you know, I, I'd find this was, you know, you know, 15 plus years ago. I mean, you know, I'd find internet forums and be able to use the language in a way and communicate with people. Right. And it was just new and exciting. Mm -hmm. you know, I was raised in a monolingual environment. Um, and it was just a totally new experience. So it was really just, Same. in a sense, accidental. And then, and then mm -hmm. French was because my German teacher is also a French teacher. So I just kind of mm -hmm. took those two and, and, you know, carried on with them. And I'm very happy I did. Because, you know, I mean, with French, I've just kind of bumbled and fumbled and stumbled my way to some kind of, uh, you know, some le level of uh, usability. And <laughs> it's a, a miracle yeah. even to me that I've managed to do that. But... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have been pretty loyal to them. And, uh, I love using them. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm, I'm glad that I'm able to use them to learn other languages. But, you know, if I, if I really analyze it, it was all just kind of fortuitous circumstances. It wasn't planned in any sense. Mm -hmm. It just kind of fell into it. And I'm happy that was the case. Yeah, Matthew, how about you? Yeah, so I think uh, French, Spanish, German, because... Um, because of where I lived, and that's what those are the classes that were offered in, in high school. Um, I had a French teacher who could also speak Spanish, and then another French teacher who spoke five languages as an accident of her birth, really, and being thrown into a boarding school when she was younger. But uh, come to think of it, I don't know if she knows how to learn languages now. I think it was just how she was brought up. But that was really motivating seeing somebody who could speak many languages. And um, mm. I wanted to learn something. Uh, I read the Barry Farber's book, and then I wanted to learn something really different. And uh, the Far East, um, like where did civilization begin as in the written tradition and it began here in China. So um, mm. uh, that's why I wanted to start learning that. And I was really passionate about that uh, most of the time. And so I, I think it's because of uh, deep cultural appreciation. Um, but, mm -hmm. uh, but, but now I feel really, I've been fighting with Arabic for a long time, but I have a lot of appreciation for that, mainly because it's, I, I guess it's important. It's really important. It's one mm -hmm. of the main kind of etymological <laughs> rivers or human mm -hmm. uh, rivers of human thoughts, like Professor said before. Um, and Latin, of course, but um, I, I, I guess you just kind of get drawn to one over the other. Um, uh, Spanish was always really strong for me because of where I lived in the States, but it wasn't yeah. my favorite 
as in I didn't actively work on it for a yeah. long time. I was always more interested in German at a certain mm -hmm. point. And right, well, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I go back to it. Yeah, you just take a fancy <laughs> mm -hmm. and follow one usually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And after after this this monologue about so so much beautiful, the oh, Matthew I, I don't even talk about my, my motivation. <laughs> no, but <laughs> jokes aside, jokes aside. Um, my motivation changed a lot. I've learned English mm -hmm. as I thought because of games. My English tanked on a time, and I just said, you know what? I'm not gonna learn it anymore. I'm fine. Okay. And then Japanese came on. I say, wow, there's a lot of games in Japanese. Yeah, that, that's the main reason I'm, why I started learning Japanese. Not anymore, right? There's other reasons, <laughs> but I started because of games again. Because that's many... why you're Fisco Gamer. Yes. Fisco yes, Gamer. Exactly. Uh, exactly. I play games too, William. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Um, and that was. I should change that name because that thing was so much years ago. I think at least 10 years. Anyways, um, and then I started to see that Japanese was super hard because I started thinking, mm -hmm. I'm going to look at words in the dictionary. I don't even know mm -hmm. how to divide this text. How am I going to even understand what they're talking about? They don't know any grammar. Then I start searching things on English. And then my vocabulary started to show off and then I say, well, it's time to go back to learn English because I know nothing what they're talking about here. Mm -hmm. And then I started and I started and I started. And that pushed off a little bit the learning of Latin and ancient Greek. Latin, I got mm -hmm. a little bit rusty on it because I'm, I'm, I don't want to just talk, talk bad about such a great culture of millions of years, but thousands of years, but... <laughs> Most of them is just poetry. Uh, I, I'm not really interested in poetry. Uh, to all poetry, poets out you're, there. You're not you're, learning you're, Latin you're, for you're gaming, talking, right? You're, you're talking about, unfortunately, to me, again, uh, Latin, I don't know how and why it is, did the textbooks for it are the exclusive province of the Romans. I mean, it was not yes. just the language of the Roman Empire. It certainly was. And, you know, mm -hmm. the Golden Age and Silver Age of, of Latin poetry and Virgil and Eid, of course, that's, you know, that's great stuff. But it's also the lifeblood of, of the Western intellectual tradition. I mean, you, you know, I find reading Thomas Aquinas, his logic in mm -hmm. Latin is much more satisfying than reading Virgil's Aeneid, you know, and I can go yes. up and read Leibniz, I can read, there's all sorts of poet. I mean, you can still read Fides et Ratio. I mean, the, the, you know, the Pope wrote this long thing, you know, 20 years ago, that's in the same language that I can read. So why all like textbooks for teaching Latin focus, I gave those examples of the Cambridge and Oxford things. I mean, yes, they're giving the context of the ancient Romans. Um, <laughs> That's that's only a portion of it. So I think that when you, yeah. when you Latin learn Latin textbooks mm. focus on the okay, that's that's the that's the origin, and that's the you know that is you know, let's concede that's the greatest richest chunk of of literature. But if you're going to say we're looking at Latin, I mean you don't even look at Latin. They don't really show you Latin. You know, so much of Livy. You know, it's anybody's writing in like 200 or 300 BC right. is all focused on, you know, mm. that, that short time period and the mm. Latin, Latin never really died. I mean, it's, you know, it became a learned language rather than this. So this is extensive long tradition of medieval mm. Latin and, you know, and, and Renaissance and, and enlightenment, um, enlightenment, philosophical Latin and, you know, and current Catholic theological Latin. I mean, it's all, the that's really interesting and furthermore there are all these people um that's what i was talking about uh what i found really interesting in the digitization of older text if you dig down and find there's so many things beyond you know the the the, the 
people were trying to teach Latin as a, as a spoken language in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And there's a lot of stuff out there that you can find for that. Um, and talking about, you know, trans, there's a long tradition of translating. Usually, they were, I guess they're the equivalent of Harry Potter books. I mean, Treasure Island, Alice in Wonderland, The Prisoner of Zenda, um, uh, the Wind in the Willows, um, all of these things have been translated into Latin so that you can read, you know, a story in a sort of a flowing way. So focusing on that makes the language come alive in my mind, whereas you know, only when I started reading yes. that kind of stuff, that made Latin come alive for me. Whereas if I just stayed reading, yeah, Horace and Catullus, no, I, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, that would not make it ever me be able to think in, in Latin. Right. Yeah, that, that is a big problem of mine because I, I don't know if you remember, Doctor, but I'm not too keen on to on to fiction. Right? I'm not mm -hmm. too keen on it. I don't hate it. I I may write may read it, but I like more science. And that's why the ancient Greek is so good for me because there's so much thing that ties down to our study of anything basically today like for example mathematics the word mathematics come from ancient greek like um biology uh, the words come from ancient greek directly and this is enough for me to get interested in the language but with latin it, it's kind of difficult because you said you said yes there's a lot of of content out there yes but I don't want to fall into the trap of getting search and search and search for good materials and never study the language. And that is a big trap for myself. I can't speak for those people, but for myself is big, right? I don't want to fall into the, the trap of, oh, no, no, I'm going to search more. No, this is not very good. Let me search for another one. Matthew, you're one. smiling. You've been there. You know all about this, right? Hoarding digital materials and just collecting and just, <laughs> you don't do anything with them yeah <laughs> you've been there too christopher oh god yeah i mean well i've got that roots of the russian language book i haven't studied right i spent uh, like 10 years ago i spent about 300 dollars on vietnamese materials like I don't, I don't know a word in vietnamese i've still got them sitting <laughs> in my shelf so it's, it's, it's easy to convert i mean i bought you know your uh Korean verbal conjugation book uh yeah. you know I've, well, I've done a little bit of korean but um you know it's still a ways off before i can use those books but yeah, that's that's another problem. You know, you just go down a rabbit hole from um, mm -hmm. you know, hoarding materials. It's, if you, I justified, if you ever, I oh, justified it by saying that I was building the um, the world's biggest resource library for mm. you know, for languages, and so when I would buy things that's like I'm never going to study this, but I just you know it's available and. This is particularly, this was back in my Korean days when I wasn't married yet and I had a decent salary. And it's like, okay, I can spend my money on something. Might as well put things here. So I did uh, make a count at one point and I have, uh, I remember um, the, the, the neatest place I've ever seen, like that was called the Mediatek at the Humboldt University in Berlin, where it's just like, it's just a language learning laboratory, not, not laboratory, but all books. I mean, just like everything related to learning languages you go in. And I think they had something like 50 odd different languages. And they had, they had so much stuff for the languages they had. For a lot of languages, I only have like one book. This is the only book out there. But at one point I had like stuff for learning about 150 languages. And, you know, I, the whole purpose I did that was I was always wanting to, like, share it with other people. It's like, oh, you want something for this language? I, I hear here's some resource I have. So I love we still people. want to we still want to use it. We <laughs> still the want tour? to live. <laughs> there is an there. Need it. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. So I love to do that. But, you know, I, I've got some funny stories about that, too. You know, just like, you know, when when, you know, I, so I had this huge language laboratory that I've like dragged all the way across, literally across the world. I started collecting in Korea. I took it from Korea to Lebanon, Lebanon to the States, States to Singapore, Singapore to Dubai, now Dubai to- That costs a lot of, that's a lot of money. It is, yeah, I, I spent a lot of money transporting it. And, and the funny thing, the funniest thing about it was, I mean, it make funny things of horrible things, but like after, you know, we left 
Lebanon in, in, in chaos as, you know, as, as, as war broke out. And, and I didn't pack my stuff up. It was packed up and shipped to me. And I got it. And it's like, I hardly lost anything. And my wife is going through her stuff. And this is missing. That's missing. This is missing. And I'm like, I only lost one book. And she said, nobody wants your language books. <laughs> Hey, no, no, that, no, but, but, but that's not the way to look at it. This was a sign from the gods of language learning. This yes, was a sign, to right? It together. They looked down upon us. Right. The sign for it to donate, doctor. Start yeah. creating uh, uh, about, shipments about for your us. Language Brazil, language. for example. Start mm -hmm. sending shipments for us. <laughs> it's a good idea. Yeah. Did, did, um, did you find, actually, that... I mean, besides having personal affinity, just a deep personal affinity, which I assume you did for several languages, did you find that the ones that you, like, was resources, just amount of resources, one of the determining factors in, okay, I'm going to take Arabic instead of Hindi to this top level? Because yeah, I've, like, I myself and, have kind yeah, of... Yeah, amount and I've, quality I've, of resources, sorry, yes, that does, that is, that is one factor. If you have Vast, you know, if you have a large number of good resources, obviously they can spark your interest and yeah. you say, hey, I can actually do something with this. Whereas what yeah. are, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I don't know what's out there for, for Georgian with you, Christopher. I mean, how many things are there out there for that? I mean, we're just talking about people have been teaching Latin for so long. I mean, there, there is just so much stuff out there for Latin and 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 you know, that's just one reason to take it to a higher level is that, you know, the resources mm -hmm. are there for you to do that. I mean, how, mm -hmm. how, how much other than the text themselves is just not much stuff that you can do to, you know, embark on the learning of, 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 of middle high German, you know, you, can, you don't need to do that much, but you can just build it, but yeah, that's definitely a factor. But I that's wonder, not, the language is where it keeps, oh, I'm sorry, Christopher, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to ask, I'm, you know, just kind of following on from um, Chase's question, you know, in the case of Korean, I mean, I know you've said the reason you learned Korean was because you settled on that, you found that FSI material that suggested it was, you know, marginally more difficult than Japanese, mm -hmm. Chinese, Arabic. I mean, was that really the only reason? Because it seems like at a certain point you'd have to yeah. have a pretty serious motivation to learn a language like Korean. I, I, that, that I, truly, I was also curious about this. I was also that, curious about that this. That truly was the only reason I embarked on learning Korean. It sounds kind of dumb now, but I just, I wanted the challenge of, you know, of, of learning the most difficult language I could find. And with hindsight, I don't believe, A, uh, I've seen, well, however, they did that at the Foreign Service Institute. You know, I think it depended on the instructor, and so maybe the next year Japanese was the most difficult. And maybe yeah, the next yeah. year, I don't think that a. I don't think that Korean is truly marginally more different than difficult than those. I think I just happened to latch onto it in a year when they scored it that way, and then b. Uh, with more mm -hmm. understanding and hindsight, I think that just as we're talking. Korean, Japanese, Arab, all these languages have vast numbers of resources. Compared to that, learning, say, an unscripted language, some language, you know, from the jungles of Brazil that nobody has studied before, that would definitely be much more difficult. Everything back to Hall, language in, in context. I mean, going out and, and, and learning, you know, something that there's, there's no resources for where you just have to go yes. and learn it from the language itself, from the people that, and if that language is totally different and totally difficult, that would be much more difficult. Yeah. But yeah, that's the only reason I, I settled on Korean. I said, okay, I, I want a challenge. I want to learn something totally different and I want to learn it there by doing it. So I just have to throw myself into it. Um, and once mm -hmm. I did, I was committed and, you know, and then I was there and it is rich and interesting and challenging. And so, you know, it did, mm -hmm. it did you know, get cut off, but yeah, I, I launched myself into that uh, for the sake of the challenge. It, it, from the other advanced languages you guys have reached, I believe Christopher, you and Professor are the same. You both have a high level of French and German and Professor, you continuously, um, uh, made the case, and I said in my I said in my questions, I, I agree with this that in terms of best bang for your buck of time invested learning versus resources and material you get for that, French and German are the two um, are the two best bang for your bucks, right? The two starter beginner languages that any mm -hmm. native English speaker 
should, if they were going to embark on systematic polygraphy, could begin with because there's good stuff there and you get a lot of material for it. What I was curious with, and my question was phrased as such, was um, from the other languages you guys have studied and or reached a very high level and that you could use materials for them, are there any other, um, maybe again, not as good bang for your buck, but still any other good stepping stone languages that um, you have found that is, there's tons of good language learning material in them that you know nobody else that you could not access if you don't this was my experience with mandarin i should say this is why i'm asking i think there's mandarin. some good there's good news for you there i think russian is one of those this russian has yeah. been used as a, as a scholarly language for tons yeah. of, of little smaller languages in in you know in central asia and that were part of the soviet mm -hmm. empire in that area i think russian wow. is definitely one and then Spanish yeah. also unquestionably for all the, you know, all, all those kind of indigenous languages of, of the Americas, dictionaries and uh, stuff. South America. For mm -hmm. and the like. So I would say okay. probably Russian, Russian and Spanish are, are close seconds to, to French and, and German. Okay, good. good. You so remember, it was a real surprise um, to me um, that, you know, and, and looking at Georgian resources, I had always assumed that Russian would be the kind of the, the, the best language to learn because you know obviously the geographical and historical ties and there, I mean there is stuff available but I mean by far the highest quality and the best until recently the best dictionary for Georgian was a uh, Georgian to German dictionary mm -hmm. and uh, yeah wow. textbooks scholarly reference materials also awesome. it's there's some good stuff in English too but I mean most of it is in German and actually I mean Buska Falak, uh, really have published some amazing stuff they've got you know, mm -hmm. readers and uh, you know, verb tables because you know German uh, Georgian verbs are supposed to be particularly daunting, which I'm sure I'll find out soon. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's it's just surprising to me. There's not quite as much. I could be wrong. Maybe someone out there knows yeah. some good stuff in Russian can convince me to add that into my uh, already overloaded uh, <laughs> regime. <laughs> mm. William, I mean, here in America, I mean. We have indigenous languages too. That's why I started out this sort of comeback with, with Ojibwe. I'm supposedly in the Ojibwe homeland. I see license plates yeah. all around me from the three reservations. Uh, in Bemidji itself, you have in any public building, you know, the words for, you know, bathroom, men's, women's, you know, welcome, or, you know, in all public doors, you see it written out. I've oh. been here for going on three years. I've never heard a word of it spoken around. I've seen mm. people who, you know, in you know, in, in 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 the grocery store who, you know, look clearly like they are indigenous right. Native Americans. I've I've never heard them speaking it. Um, I can't think of a time in my you know travels across the United States mm. where I've I've heard, you know, really any living. Um, native languages being spoken. Is, William, is it similar in Brazil or have you, do you hear native indigenous languages being spoken? Have you ever encountered any? Oh, it's so sad, doctor. Everyone here is monolingual to the core, mm -hmm. to the core. Uh, here, English is like the, uh, the main language of the dreams of people. I, I talk English with my, my brother. He learned English as well but he's better at speaking because he listens a lot more than me. So he, he has problems writing. Sometimes he writes wrong. But when we speak together, everyone's like, wow, we speak English. Like this is something from, from outside world. Everyone here is monolingual to the core. It's super sad. Mm -hmm. I don't so, see any language besides Portuguese. Mm. How about Christopher in, in New Zealand? Is, is, is Maori, is it, is it co- it's officially a bilingual. It's uh, yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's an official language um, alongside I think New Zealand Sign Language. But um, I mean, it's, it's very similar to what what you just described. You know, you see, you know, signs and things, and the government pushes to make sure that it's that it's seen everywhere. Um, I certainly don't hear it in Auckland. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever heard it spoken. Um, I mean, there are areas up north where it's used, but it's. Mm -hmm. my, I mean, my understanding is it's mainly a language of the home, and so it, you know, for someone like me to learn it, I mean, I'm, I can't just you know, pop around to someone's house and, you know, stay with them. I mean, it's, you know, kind of awkward. And it doesn't really have, I mean, it has, uh, you know, a large oral tradition of folk tales and, you know, songs and things, but mm. 
doesn't really have much of a written literary tradition because it was only written when the, you know, the British colonized in the 1800s. So it's, I mean, I've got books for it and I've, you know, of course, considered learning it, but it's, you know, just from a selfish perspective, it's like, what do I do with it? I mean, I mm -hmm. watch the several television channels that are in monolingual Maori. It's, uh, yeah, it, it's, I mean, it is, I don't know if I'd call it moribund, like, I don't know if it's on the way out, but I, I do wonder in 50 years what state it'll be in. There are, mm -hmm. there are TV shows where people, um, you know, speak Maori. I mean, one of the main faces of the language is a guy called Scotty Morrison. He's a non-native speaker. So he, but he learned the language to a you know, very high level. It's just, um, yeah, I do, you know, the, on the odd occasion that you hear people speak the language, it's, I mean, my subjective impression as a non-speaker is that they're first and foremost English speakers kind of directly translating their thoughts into the language. Whereas if you go back and listen to radio broadcasts from, you know, 30, 40 years ago, the language has a very different lilt rhythm to it that, that kind of gives me the impression of, you know, being like a real living language that was, you know, the primary spoken language between between mm -hmm. these people you can still hear that um, but it's just it's just getting harder and harder so it's it's a shame mm -hmm. it's a beautiful language when it's spoken well i i may learn it but uh, i just you know again it's just you know what do i do with it just from, mm -hmm. that, from that selfish standpoint unfortunately matthew or chase and your and your time back in, in 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 your native land have you ever you know heard people speaking cherokee or navajo or, or anything man no but I was really interested in learning a, a indigenous language uh, or a language from, uh, you know, it was there before when us white people came. <laughs> um, right, never, never heard anything like that, no, um, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I think the most interesting Ma things along those lines would definitely be Nahuatl or some sort of Mayan or Quechua. Yes. That's why I went to... Yes. You know, when I was in South America, I looked for Quechua resources and uh, Chris, who's the archaeology student from Canada, who's, who's in the mm -hmm. coast of Brazil, I mean, he um, mm -hmm. talked about some things there too. But um, I think interestingly enough, I don't think Quechua was ever um, written uh, down, uh, but Mayan and, and Nahuatl certainly were. So there are some, uh, some texts and things uh, to look at there. Have you noted, uh, so yeah, I would say this has been the same, unfortunately, this has been hearing all of this, I mean, just from around the world, this makes me really hard, uh, my heartache, because this has been my experience in, like, as well in the States and in China, is uh, Chinese dialects, which is, I mean, granted, this is not the same comparison, because they are still spoken by millions of people as a home language, true, but in terms of media, they get no representation in China itself, and people don't really see them as, um, from what I understand, I could be wrong, correct me, Professor, you have more experience here than me, but they see it maybe as somewhat similar to Arabic speakers with their own dialects, like them, if they're not speaking Guoyu, uh, the Mandarin, the official language, they kind of look at their own dialects like, they like sheepishly, like if you can speak it, they would get excited. But if you ask them about it, they kind of see it as not a real quote unquote, you know, not a serious language. It's just uh, whatever that means. Not a serious, not a real language. It's just a dialect or it's just, uh, you know, it's our, what we say at the home, but we can't have serious discourse in it. Or there's this very, um, what, do you, what would you call it? Like self, not even self-deprecating, self uh, don't believe that it's a very serious mode of intercourse. And I feel like to a more or lesser extent that I, I, I'm not, I, I'm not one of these modern academics getting all on language imperialism. I don't, know. but th that's a different problem, but I do get sad when I see, when I hear stories like this. That so are you guys saying, I, I mean, moving. one thing I've always heard that China does have lots of, um, a minority languages that might be oppressed like Uyghur or something like that that you know are you know or something mm -hmm. but also that the dialects quote unquote dialects of China I can't think of they are not they are not I'm sorry I should make that clear I put dialects in with it they are not the ones I'm talking about are different languages they call them Fangian, which would literally translate to place language okay. in Chinese so and they translate it, it, it as dialects it, it, if you go to Shanghai they do speak in a totally different fashion from in Beijing. They speak in a total, they should translate, what they mean to say is topolex, 
Fangyan should be translated as play, uh, the, the language of this region. And yes, in Shanghai, they would speak a, uh, the, their mother tongue is a completely different language. So in, you, in you, two having, you two having learned Mandarin, if you went to Shanghai and tried to speak with the people in Shanghai, do we just like in Hong Kong, you, you would not be able to communicate. But that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about the, you know, the, the several hundred different so-called minority languages, non-Chinese family, non-Sino-Tibetan languages you're talking about. Uh, yes, I was, I was actually referring to the other Chinese languages as well, but even it's an even more extreme case with the, the Uyghurs that I have met in China or Thai, some Tibetans. I actually had a Tibetan student who um, she could, bless her heart, she could write in Tibetan. She knew basic Tibetan, but all her schooling um, had been in Mandarin or English. And she, from a young age, her parents could speak Tibetan, but they just didn't really, they saw the need of giving her some basic um, lessons, like I just said. But again, they didn't really see it as a future uh, potential career growth, right? Like why teach her Tibetan, right? That's not where the jobs are. Um, and so, yeah, it's more extreme there, but with the other Chinese languages as well, they are kind of downplayed in China. Like if you want to, like your example, yes, if I went to Shanghai and tried to, if I tried to communicate with them, I could, I could because they would be able to speak um, Mandarin. Mandarin, everybody in mainland China, all the schools, all official written works, all that's in Mandarin. So they are literally, most Chinese people are bilingual but they don't say they're bilingual. I shouldn't say most Chinese people, a lot of Chinese people. Like in Hong Kong, they would speak Cantonese, but they grow up learning Mandarin at the same time, all the written uh, discourses in Mandarin. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I could, but I, yeah, but again, the, the government, I don't, I don't want to go there, but the authorities that be and the situation that be wants to unify you know, the country, if a country wants to be great, wants to be powerful, we should have one uh, language, one, one common language. And so I, I understand it in a way, but it's similar to the situation in the US with uh, the native languages of, I mean, they're, they're beautiful in a way. It's, I wish, I would love to learn Nahuatl or Navajo if, I, if the resources were there. And I wish the community would get, um, uh, could create more stuff there and feel a need to, expand it but anyway, i can't I'm think of anywhere in the world where um as you said authorities powers that be governments you know are really um mm. sort of trying to push or you know really encourage the survival of their languages which makes you really wonder when you go to a place like ethnologue and they give you a nice set number mm. there's 6,372 or 9,418. I don't know how you know how many languages there are, but I guess some of you are undocumented and one out there, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's amazing to me that so many are still around and surviving, given the more yeah. of a state that we're all. So we've talk, we're, we're talking about the United States, Brazil, and China, which are like the, uh, that's like the third, fourth, and fifth no, the you know, third, fourth, and fifth largest <laughs> countries in the world. We're talking, so we haven't talked about Canada or Russia, but you know, apart from those, I mean, and us people who've got the mm -hmm. the language bug and like to listen out and hear for other languages, it's it's hard to to hear them and see them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know of any any place that really is like saying, you know, we, you know, particularly when you read about African countries or places like that, where you say, yeah, they've got you know, three hundred uh, uh, countries, they've got three hundred languages here. Are they uh, pushing all three hundred? I think that, I don't know, in, in Nigeria, I think each region does have it. I mean, so that there is, you know, there's an Igbo region in Nigeria, there's a Yoruba region, there's a there's a Hausa region. Um, so there are countries where certainly India, I think, has 22 official languages and they are, you know, strong in, in their areas. So I don't think, I don't think Gujarati or Marathi are in any kind of peril uh, because of Hindi yes. and English, but right. the India supposedly has 200 or 500, I don't know how many languages. So there are state right. languages, and official languages. So those that like mm -hmm. select group of 22 might be somehow protected, but I don't think the others are, mm -hmm. are, um, are have any set, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. What was this? I'm curious, Professor. Within in the Arabic speaking countries, um, I have often one of the 
in my kind of battle between should I learn Persian or Arabic, one big knock that I always kind of have is that I have this impression in my mind from reading about, uh, but not from anybody with firsthand experience that in a lot of the Arabic speaking countries, they tend to view English and French as like the international status, uh, not status language, but similar to what I just described in China with Mandarin, but in the Arabic countries do a lot of parents kind of want to encourage their kids from a young age to reach a high level in English and French at the expense of uh, their native tongue, their native tongues. I can really only speak for Lebanon and the United Arab Emirates. And right. um, for those two. Yeah. In the United Arab Emirates these days, I would say yes. I mean, it's still, I mean, the government does, you know, have... Arabic is the official policy and they, you know, people speak with there, but right. there is such a strong, strong, strong push to get everybody fluent in English. And they've got such a huge influx of, of foreigners in the country. And there's, there's zero yeah. expectation that, you know, you're, you're, you know, some you will speak, Pakistani you or Bangladeshi or, or British person coming to work there will, will learn any, any Arabic. So they're, um, yeah. This they are not consciously downplaying. I mean, the government there does like support like poetry readings and right. like, cultural things and museums and stuff. So, you know, they're sure. sort of playing it kind of both both ways. But yeah, I would say mm -hmm. that there are plenty of of people there who would basically think that it's more important that my son or daughter be fluent in English. So I want to put them in an international mm -hmm. school and. And right. uh, I'm not consciously trying to slight Arabic, but if Arabic gets slighted, I yeah, guess it'll be okay if, because we'll speak it at home. It, it doesn't matter, but she needs sure. to know. Yeah, I think that is the case. Mm. And, in, and in Lebanon, though, the situation is a bit better. It's a bit more equal. It's been longer since I've been there. Uh, Le Lebanon is more oh, sort of established true. as a true. bilingual or trilingual country. Trilingual. Um, so, uh, and I think okay. also okay. Lebanon has a... Lebanon has a literary tradition. Lebanon has a strong yes. publishing tradition. Lebanon has lots of famous authors who, who write in Arabic, mm -hmm. um, whereas mm -hmm. the United Arab Emirates, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a miracle of like modernity. It, it, it didn't exist 50, 60 years ago. There was nothing there. It's like made yeah. out of like out of the desert and everything is new and everything is made and pushed that way. And so- Here, I love. Miracle or monstrosity? Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't be that hard. I should be that harsh, but yeah. yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Well, we are coming. I think we're going to make this the record for the longest uh, talk yet. Uh, that I think the other one's an hour and 59 minutes. I think we're going to actually go over into the two hour mark. And I'm uh, getting. Uh, feeling guilty about those of you who are waking up and taking all of your study time. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, my wife come by a little before and she said, your dinner is ready. And so uh, I'm not like my cat who's crying for my dinner right now, but it's uh, getting on the end of the day here. So I think we need to wrap this up. Does anybody have any final concluding thoughts or ideas that you'd like to talk about with, with Hall's book or you know, this sort of lecture series that I've given on five past five past uh, topics or lectures any outstanding questions or anything remaining I do doc mm. um, about the correlation drills that Hal says because mm -hmm. we always talk about ancient Greek let's continue talking about it I, I saw that people liked a lot how we implant those with verb conjugations on ancient Greek because ancient Greek is one of the most irregular languages I ever saw in my mm -hmm. life with verb conjugations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know all the languages, but I think ancient Greek is out there on the, the irregularities. Mm -hmm. How do we, we work with the correlation drills, the substitution drills, or whatever drills for us to get the verbs down? Well, you would need somebody to make it for you. A professor of ancient Greek would have to do it. You'd have to put in a special request to, and say, you know, basically, I, I think it's it's a shame um, that when we talked about that with another group, that the, the whole, these drills are just not given anymore. They're just not, you know, the, the, the repertoire of different exercises. If you take um, a, a textbook that's published by, I don't know, Teach Yourself or Colloquial or something um, last year, 
they've got six, seven, eight different types of exercises, match, mix, put a fill in here, translate this, but there's never any, um, there's never any uh, of these correlation or substitution drills there. And so I think a good request to um, a, a publishing house would be in order there and just like pointing to these old mm -hmm. patterns and exactly what you just said, this, this is a highly irregular language with um, with the, the verbs and just give me something where, you know, I'm actually, you know, got a, a correlation, you know, okay, I have this here. So, you know, put, put in a different word, make the change there. But it's, I don't think that's not something that you can make yourself as a learner, unfortunately. I mean, for, for Latin, I, I got some phrases and at least for the nouns, I, I didn't did for the verbs. I got mm -hmm. enough phrases that I could use as the same noun in the other cases. So it's really simple in mm -hmm. Latin. But when I get to verbs in ancient Greek, mm, mm. the things are not so simple. No. So yeah, no. I, I got a doubt about that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Uh, Christopher, you've been with us the least. This is your one and only time. Uh, this Christopher Swan <laughs> show, anything special to say? Hopefully not the one and only time. Hopefully join another no, one. No, no, you can come back. We'll have others, others but you know, this, this, you're, everybody's, this is, this is a, re, a repeat, a return, a rerun for everybody else. Yeah. Um, I actually wanted to finish, but there was a comment that um, actually you left, Matthew, on uh, I think it was Levin Budge's comment. So he was, um, you know, he was just talking about a different way of using Anki um, as a scheduler instead of reviewing information. He just uses it to tell them what lessons to review. There was a comment that Matthew said. He said. Um, Oh, sorry, this was in re re uh, response to another comment Levin made. He said, um, in the gym world, there's a phrase, uh, well, sanitize it, uh, buck around itis. <laughs> but people who spend hours in the gym and see no results because they're focusing on you know, fads and useless exercises and avoid simple strength training, compound exercises. And then he makes an analogy to shadowing and scriptorium, uh, I guess, to you know, squats and deadlifts in the gym. But um, what Matthew <laughs> said is, you know, I think that illness that you mentioned can crop up a lot with uh, polyitis. You know, the itch they feel will go away if they just dive into doing something in the language. And then he said, then he said, Matthew, uh, you know, talk about extreme procrastinating with setting up Excel spreadsheets for elaborate study plans, which, yes, I'm, I'm familiar with that. And then, like we said at the end, we should set up a polyitis support group. So I, uh, I fully support that motion. Um, I guess we've got the language for them, but it would be nice to have something uh, in the future to... Mm. Yeah, I mean, just to, to talk with people about that, you know, this, this affliction, it is, it is contagious. You know, I caught ancient Greek as well, so. Yeah, look what you did, man. You gave them the ancient Greek bug, you know, and then there was that other comment, uh, we gave somebody a Sanskrit bug, so. I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gentlemen, thank you for coming and uh, having this final talk about uh, Hall's book. And uh, yes, uh, Christopher, as you mentioned, uh, I will, um, as I, I mentioned there, I'm uh, not going to do another series right away. The holidays are coming up, maybe slow down a little bit in December, but in January, mm -hmm. I'll do another series, and this seems like a good format. So I uh, hope to see and talk to you all again at some point in the not-too-distant future. Absolutely. Pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye. Cool. Thank you very much. Bye. See you, guys. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.